Hello and welcome to Money, Me and COVID-19, where we talk to opinion leaders about the financial, business and social impact of the coronavirus. My guest today really needs no introduction. He's managed to combine becoming the country's best known stock market pundit through his media appearances, but he's also been a founder and a key part of growing 7IM into the business it is today with a team of 300 people and 14 billion pounds under management. He's a winner of the Elite Investor Club's Lifetime Achievement Award, which you can see on the shelf behind him. And he's also in the middle of restoring the, uh, the home of the former, uh, the former home of the famous artist Camille Pissarro, which you can see in the painting of his left shoulder. He is, of course, Justin Urquhart Stewart. Justin, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Very flattered. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So, 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 Justin, I'm rather hoping that with all your decades of experience, you can help us poor investors to, to, to achieve some clarity here. But I suspect that even for you, this is a relatively unprecedented event. Now, you, you've had a month in lockdown to reflect on it. What's your take on the, the impact COVID-19 is having on, on the global economy and on the financial markets? I mean, you're absolutely right. It is fascinating because often people say, you've seen this before. Well, we've seen crashes and things like that before. Of course we have. No, we have not seen this before. So this is all completely new, completely different. And therefore, we need to regard it in a rather different way um, because it will have very long-term impacts indeed. Now, you can, of course, uh, follow some of the strange people who actually want to go around blowing up uh, you know, 5G masts and things like that and regard us as being close to the end of the world, or you can regard it actually as being, yes, a financial and economic disaster, but is one which is quite capable of recovering from, which I believe it will do. But it's going to take some nerve in doing so, some sensible decisions, but when you look at our politicians, I'm not too sure you're necessarily going to get those in any short order, but equally some good economic decisions, because actually uh, the business of the, of the economy is likely going to win out that, the logic of that, so long as we have the right decisions with regard to making sure that sufficient funds and capital and investment are made available at the right time to be able to make sure we can recover. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very strange. Some people, I think, are still talking about a, a short, sharp recession and a V-shaped recovery, but I, I just can't see that being the case. I mean, how do you see the rest of the year panning out? I, I just, it's just not going to be. You'll get a form of recovery and there'll be some excitement in the market will react as we've already seen the market actually go through some uh, some quite exciting moments of recovery. But be wary, these are going to be trapdoors here because there are so many elements. Now, the key issue, the good news about this is interest rates are low and because of that, the cost of money is cheap. Also, we have the ability of the government to be able to actually produce money well, magically, we know it can. It's called quantitative easing. Uh, now you've got QE2. I don't know if mean a dodgy boat because you don't want to be on that because you'll probably get some terrible virus. Um, but actually, you'll have the ability for governments not just to actually produce more debt like that, but to use some innovation here to actually allow us to be able to have more access to different types of capital. Now, to give you some examples for this, um, I don't mean just uh, co uh, countries producing more debt or even having more infrastructure plans, because those are all long-term things. That's a bit like the New Deal. It doesn't really matter whether it happens or not. It's the sort of highlight, the sort of uh, the good news that is given uh, by government. Uh, what you need to be able to have, though, is access to capital locally. And in order to do that, actually be able to encourage people to invest in local businesses and local infrastructure because governments won't be able to do it. Where does that money come from? The answer is it'll actually be coming from the likes of us. Um, and they, then to do that, you're going to need some more innovation. And one of the areas I'm currently looking at at the moment is actually uh, helping to advise on regional investment hubs so that people can actually look at investing locally in local businesses not don't necessarily mean startups, but existing businesses, not even ones that are necessarily floated at the moment, um, to be able to have simple mechanisms of participating in those businesses. They will need capital. They can be perfectly sensible businesses. You're not doing it out of charity, but you're doing it out of uh, being able to be quite sensible, investing locally, cost effectively. Why is this important and can be done now? Because actually, if you're going to, have to go back through the original mechanisms through London again and through the alternative investment market, knows that they are too expensive and too slow. We can establish this actually in quite short order. And one of the areas I hope we're going to be able to do it initially will actually will be in uh, the Midlands, in Birmingham, 
where there's a demand for this, not only from people wanting to invest in local businesses, often quite significant investment clubs, but also private officers as well, and also private individuals, companies themselves that say, I'm not being able to get money out of the bank, except obviously in the short term at the moment, um, but actually other investment money, and I cannot go to, can't afford to go to AIM, the London stock market doesn't help me, and the corporate finance houses in London are gonna to be too expensive. So here is the opportunity for some innovation. So that's actually what I think is only quite exciting. So what I've been writing about most recently is getting the government to come up with almost a form of financial pinata, you know, one of those paper donkeys you have to smack to get all the goodies out of. What I want the government to come out is a financial pinata when we're coming out of lockdown, where you can come out with all these goodies, the corona bonds, so that people can invest in actually helping to finance the government, put it this way, probably be uh, in, in uh, there'll probably be inflation bonds, uh, index linked bonds with a loyalty bonus after five years, and be able to make sure that you've actually got further support for EIS and SEIS, be able to have further support into uh, the uh, into uh, ISAs as well, but also then the ability to be able to reconnect the local financial plumbing for local investment. That's put together would make a very exciting financial pinata. Does not mean you get a V-shaped recovery, but it means you start getting confidence coming back in. That's the word you need to have. That has to come from government. That has to come from financial infrastructure, financial industry itself, to then be able to say, to convince you and I and all our clients and investors, to be able to say, I'll invest in this. I support it. That's a, that's a fascinating concept and, and in some ways it's almost kind of back to the future because of course we used to have regional stock exchanges um, and, and also I could see that actually playing well into Boris's plan for, for putting more infrastructure and investment into the region. So you might find you're pushing against an open door in, in government. I think so I and mean, certainly if he wants to replace the red wall with the blue wall and make sure it stays blue you're quite right he's going to need that but what I don't want to see is the reinvention of silly gits in red braces again so that's people like me um, the old-fashioned stockbrokers trying to do it because they were, were actually in business for themselves what we actually want to have is the plumbing to create the mechanism so that finance capital could be put into the regions cost effectively locally to start with but if it's successful then it will attract from other regions, it'll attract from other areas, may even attract internationally. So yes, it is almost like the local stock exchanges, but without all the extra costs of market makers and all those elements and bits and pieces, you don't need that. Keep it simple, actually try and reform what's going on. But unfortunately, you know what our industry is like? We love looking back at sepia photographs of weren't we very good when in the old days, actually we weren't. We were running a cartel, it's quite expensive, but it sounds awfully polite. No, no, now is the time for some really cost-effective innovation to try and actually try and actually give some people the ability not just to invest, the companies to be invested in, and also uh, provide something which is cost-effective. Now you're doing something worthwhile. Uh, yeah, that, that, absolutely. Now, the, uh, and I think I can see why we need a different kind of organization, because if you look, for example, at the business uh, interruption loans concept, which is okay in and of itself, and what the big banks who've been charged with implementing it have done has been to put so much slow bureaucracy in the way, demands for personal guarantees and so on, that here we are a month plus into the scheme. I think there's only two or 3,000 loans actually being approved. So yep. we need to get the money out there faster. And that's the issue here. We haven't been brave enough. The concept of actually saying to people, well, bad banks will, they'll, they'll take on 20% responsibility. Well, no, it's still 20%. That means they still have to go through due process. They have to do the checking. Why? Well, because that's what they're supposed to do. They're banks. Whether you think they're any good at it or not, that's not the point. No, no, moments like this, this is where you actually need free money and lots of it. Now, you may get worried about the fact that actually our level of debt is going to go up to a high level. Remember, our debt to GDP ratio, debt to the value of the economy, was it about 88%, got down to 82% after the, uh, the period of austerity, but now it's going to go up to 150, maybe 200%. And people say, this is appalling, we've never done it. Yes, we have. We have been there before. Now, you weren't there, no, but uh, nor was I, thank heavens, quite close, but actually in 1815, we were at 200% after the Napoleonic War. It took a long time to get through that. But actually, with low-cost money, you grow the economy. And the other thing to remember, actually, is by producing this debt, this money, you're using it for investment. Investment, by its nature, is money going into something which is actually going to provide a return, either an actual financial return 
or a productivity return, if it's a motorway or a train or something like that, um, and being able to provide that return to the economy in the longer term. Don't get hung up on the fact that it's so much debt. Governments in the past have often gone along between about saying, you know, if we want to have an investment. Now is actually the opportunity, not only to actually make sure you do high levels of investment, but at astonishingly low cost. In mm. real terms, money is free. Well, it's not free, obviously, but actually in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of real uh, inflation, uh, well, real returns against inflation, it's actually at zero at the moment. So now is the time to be doing it. It's not a nice thing to do, but thank heaven we got at least that advantage. Okay, now, now if there has been one blessing to COVID-19, it's that it's taken Brexit off the national agenda for a while. Um, but when I listen to you talking about, you know, regionalization and innovation, I can't help but think we need to bring Brexit into that discussion because we've got to look at what do we want Britain to be post-Brexit. It's only next year, we're only eight months away from it. Um, so, so could you see some combination of perhaps new corporation tax rules as well as the regional corona bonds having a part to play in that? I think this is actually could be a very exciting opportunity. Leave aside all the issues we argued over Brexit in the past five years and actually sit there and say, all the countries in Europe have got a major problem to try and manage. The EU itself, or more importantly, the Eurozone members have got a big problem because unless they do adopt their pan-European corona responsibility, that goes to the, fundamentally to the heart of having a single currency. Remember, we have a single currency in Britain and we have government guilt. We all take responsibility. Whether we're a mad Scot or whatever we happen to be, we're all part of that. We may end up with regional debt, but actually it becomes centrally responsible. Unless you're going to get the position whereby Germany can start, can, can start taking with some of that responsibility, sharing that responsibility, it will eventually fall apart. Now, leave aside the currency for one moment, and now actually think about the reforms of what those company, countries need to do. They, too, need to be able to have new mechanisms of getting money in and be able to make sure they have new money into different countries, different areas, so that we want to be able to make sure that German, German companies can invest easily in Britain and be able to do so, as they have done in the past. Our regional investment process may make that easier, equally the other way around as well. So it will be a good opportunity actually to tie us in again with Europe, not in a political way, but in an economic way, to be advantage of investors and also companies and also for the greater economy overall. Okay, uh, now looking out across you know, the, the, the rest of the 2020s, um, I think one of the things a lot of people I'm talking to at the moment are struggling with is to try and uh, see where we are sitting on this kind of deflation and inflation spectrum. Because you've got lots of deflationary things, like the fact they've switched off the world's economy for a few months, but you've also got inflationary things, like they're throwing trillions of new money at it. Um, so, so, so how do you see at the moment, yes, we've got record low interest rates and relatively mm -hmm. modest inflation. How do you see that deflation to inflation curve going over the, next, the rest of this decade? It's a lovely perverse thing, isn't it? Inflation has always been evil. You and I have a, of, an, of an era where inflation eroded the value of people's capital. Um, but of course, there's a whole generation below us who, of course, never went through that at all. Don't remember 20% inflation in the United Kingdom. Perversely, of course, actually, in current terms of having debt, you want some inflation. It erodes the debt away. But I can't see too much inflation around at the moment. In fact, I see more deflation around for the time being. If we start getting a little bit more inflation coming into it, the fact is, when you look at it, we're almost turning sort of really rather Japanese. You're seeing at the moment now there's going to be greater government involvement in terms of um, not just government involvement in debt. Remember, the government owns an awful lot of debt uh, of our own debt. Now, who is the largest holder of government guilt? The answer is the government. No, they have at the moment, I think the last figure I saw was 16 billion a year of coupons are spent out on government guilt to the government, from the government. You, doesn't, you can't make it up, could you? But the Japanese have done the same. The Japanese government effectively almost controls the Japanese bond market. And of course, the Japanese have gone further and they also buy Japanese corporate shares. Um, so again, it's a controlled environment. Now, it's not actually very good for the longer term, because if you're living in a controlled environment, how do investors make money when it's a controlled market? The answer is be very careful indeed, because that will come to an end at some stage. What we, I think, have to be looking at is therefore where are the growth areas coming from? And if there's one underlying element you can see from what's happening now, and you can see it in terms of how the share prices have, have uh, been uh, relatively protected by it, technology. It's the technology that has made such a huge difference this time uh, and will continue to do so. 
um, because it's so uh, in the way that we're working, in the way that it's going to change in the future. So a combination of technology, also the other theme that's occurring, we're now becoming much more localized um, and there's going to be a greater fear about saying, actually, do I want to be able to be dependent upon a huge, great production line stretching to Bangladesh and elsewhere? Or do I actually want to bring this in more locally to, have, to actually minimize the risk? So I think there's some very interesting themes there. But to go back to the point of inflation, deflation, in theory, this should be inflationary. But at the moment, until you start seeing any constriction, I can't see the inflation coming through. Okay. So, so just quickly talk us through, in terms of the main asset classes, you know, stocks, bonds, property, gold, you know, wh where do you see those coming, you know, going over the coming months and years? And, and, and what should investors be thinking about in terms of asset allocation? Well, I will start with obviously the largest asset class by far and away is obviously going to be government debt, overall bonds. And what are the returns going to go on there? The answer is, well, close to zero in reality. Of course, unless you want something that's inflation proofed. And if I have my domestic Corona bonds with a loyalty bonus to it as well, it's a little bit more attractive, but you're not gonna get rich on that, but it's gonna give you some security. And if you believe the government's never gonna go bust, governments can go bust, but actually Britain's never actually defaulted. Even America defaulted on its debt at some stage, but Britain's actually had a very good reputation. So we assume that's safe, so there's some safe money there. Equities, I'm still gonna be the firm enthusiast for equities. Why? Well, obviously the primary driver of equities is not the price going up, it's still the dividends, and it's the compounding of those dividends. The bad news is, of course, as we've seen over the past few months, companies have been cutting their dividends, quite understandably, because you can't be seeing, oh, I'm going to pay out billions of dividends, oh, by the way, can I have a handout? That's not going to go down terribly well, as EasyJet found out really quite quickly. Um, so actually, that's going to have to be balanced quite carefully indeed. Having said that, the miners and, and the, uh, the oil companies, or certainly the energy companies, are still going to be in a position where they're going to be doing that, and they want to be able to have shareholders, loyal, longer-term shareholders, mostly institutions to whom they pay dividends, and obviously then, as we are the investors behind that, hopefully benefiting from that. So still looking at those, but be careful, it's changing. What's changing? Well. The mining company is going to be changing because in terms of how mining companies are behaving, we can see how that's already being impacted because green issues, which were nice to have five years ago, are now center stage. Oil, well, the oil is, is fascinating as well. Saudi Arabia desperate to sell Aramco because in 100 years time, it's going to be worth, what's the technical term, sod all. No one's going to want oil. Uh, they'll want something else. Um, and so they're desperate to try and get the value out now if they possibly can. But this value, it's going to be very small indeed. But the oil price will pick up to a certain extent, but we're not going to see the glory days of thought, I think. That's going to be highly unlikely. The other area, therefore, is going to be in terms of, I think the one that's been so heavily hit is obviously going to be consumer spending, because consumers haven't been more be able to go out and spend. And of course, they're frightened. They don't want to spend at the moment until I've got some confidence back. So here's the measure. Give me some confidence. I'll start spending a bit more. This is the common theme you saw back after the banking crisis. The Americans fixed the banking system quickly. People started moving house again. The house prices started going up. They got confidence. They spent money and off they go. It's not that easy this time. But if I have my financial pañata, then I've at least hopefully got a government creating some confidence to create the private investor coming in behind that. But we'll have to wait and see. It's not a big V shape. It's a, a little V and then a long, slow, uh, sagging recovery. So... That's going to be a, a, an, is, an interesting issue. The other element, of course, is going to be in terms of housing uh, market, something we're all uh, attached to. And the good news is we all still need housing. But the betting on the old housing market before is not going to be there for the time being. So I think we need to be really rather careful of that one indeed. Um, but so there's still always going to be demand. But in terms of what you saw in terms of property, in terms of the, the, the rent you saw and the yield you got from the high street, um, and from those areas, those days are gone. You just have to see what's happening with Arcadia and Debenhams and the like. Um, that's all changing shape. I come back to the issue of technology. Technology, not just in terms of Amazon and, the, uh, and having to deal with the FANG stocks, the fashionable ones, but on the other hand, they have done very well and they're gonna probably continue to do well. But the development of further on from that in terms of actually further uh, elements of entertainment, uh, elements of being able to actually provide further drug support, um, elements in further uh, development of new industries. You know, it's going to be the technology is going to be leading, uh, leading it. And to that extent, that puts the UK in quite a good position. We're quite good at this sort of thing. We're good at innovating. We're just absolutely useless at being able to take it to the next stage. We innovate and probably sell it to the Americans. Now, if I've got my local funding operation, 
I can actually now develop it and then fund it to the next stage. Then it gets sold to the Americans, but I hope it doesn't, no. But hopefully then we actually create more value here. That's what we need to be able to do. And after all, look at what the universities have done over the past 15 years. They've gone from just being universities into actually now developing much more in terms of not just business schools, but also making sure the ability to actually spin businesses out, not always very efficiently, but again, they haven't been able to get the funding structure. So again, this the element of localization, this provides for all of us, I think, uh, for investors, opportunities. Risky ones, but opportunities. But at least with this one, you could, they're going to be local opportunities. You're going to probably know more about them, which I find a little bit more encouraging. Excellent. So, so um, coming back to you know, the, the bigger picture from an investment perspective, has 7IM changed its strategy at all as a result of COVID-19? At the moment, it's interesting because I have to actually be able to declare an interest here. When we set the business up, I said, look, when Tom and I were doing this, we said, look, when we get to 65, we must step down. Um, because you've got to let the kids take over. Otherwise, you just punch, end up with Montreal Park sitting there for donkey's years. I forgot I'm 65. So I suddenly found myself hanging, having to step down. So I've now left it to them is the answer. So what are they doing about it? And the answer is, well, and they're being suitably circumspect. They are being very conservative over it because that is that the nature of the house, not taking big risks. Rule one of investing is don't lose the sodding stuff. Rule two, refer to rule one, grow it steadily over time. And you know, some of their performance has not been brilliant over the past few years, but uh, 10 to 15 years, which is how I like to try and do it, it's done exactly what we wanted to do, that old phrase of what it was supposed to do on the side of the tin. I expect them to be continuing to try and do that, but I expect also to be looking at the technology side to be able to see some of those more exciting areas of growth. One area that I've always liked in the past, but I fear is going to be a lot more difficult, is going to be that of emerging uh, economies. That's going to be very difficult. I don't include China in that because that's not an emerging economy. Um, but the older areas where people would say, this is the area where you're going to see greater returns coming through, they're going to have huge trouble with debt, debt forgiveness, getting in more capital. The medium term, I think there's some great opportunities there, but I think you're going to have to separate those out. If we want to find some winners there, I'm still going to be down in Southeast Asia, I suspect. Um, but uh, I wouldn't be rushing to do that. We've got bigger issues to solve closer to home. Okay, now, I mean, most of those watching us will, will be people who've already chosen to sort of take control of their financial future. Um, my fear is for the sort of 90 plus percent of the population who remain financially illiterate. Um, <clears throat> what do you think, you know, the, the, the fallout from COVID-19 holds for many of those people? Hey, what it means is we have to actually make sure, as you and I have discussed before, the need for proper education on this. And education does not mean this is part of the UK social cultural um, course or something like that. No, this is mathematics to the core course to actually say, this is how you take this amount of money and you make it into that amount of money in order to actually be able to buy your house, be able to look after your family, look after your pensions and all those sort of things. People have to learn the finance of finance earlier rather than later. Secondly, we have to teach them something which no one ever taught us either, which is that planning across the generations as well. So as you know, what responsibility do we have to our children? Well, not necessarily give them loads of money, because as far as I'm concerned, um, I'll give them a good start. I expect them to look after themselves. But uh, what we can do, though, is actually make it as cost efficient and effective as possible and teach them what to do. It's going to be a very difficult time for them. The returns they're going to be expecting are going to be thinner. Um, and so therefore, they're going to have to find put up with some pretty thin gruel over time, which means they have to start actually saving money now um, for that longer term. And that's something I think as we as our generation probably should be doing is putting money for the next generation for their education or for their housing or such like. Not making sure that they just we're giving them a free ride, certainly not. But I think many ways we've had the best of it when it came to the property market. We've seen some fantastic returns in the stock market. Uh, and of course now we've had this really very significant change. Um, it does improve, but it doesn't go back to the way it was. Indeed. So, so as we come to the end of our, our time together, Justin, obviously we can't give investment advice, but what would your advice be to the investors that are looking at watching in this program at the moment? What, should they, what steps should they be taking to survive and hopefully prosper coming out the other end of COVID-19? Well, in the position, if you are already, and most of you have been invested, then actually the damage has already been caused probably to your equity portfolios. Um, and so to that extent, there's not a huge amount you can do. Having said that, there are going to be areas which are going to be more attractive than others. 
And although people may be saying, well, cruise ships are being bombed out, it's probably the wrong phrase to use with a cruise ship, you know what I mean? Um, it's not going to be attracting a great deal of enthusiasm over the next few years. No, but the areas of leisure and, uh, and uh, hotels and those sort of have been finding it very difficult. Um, so those are going to be areas which will come back slowly, but it's going to take some confidence to do so. Make sure your portfolio's got those longer term earners in the portfolio, which can benefit from it. Those uh, slightly dull ones, which I was talking about before, providing those dividends. But also those ones which will, I think, be throwing off the exciting businesses um, of technology. Now, there's going to be another interesting element coming out of this. Companies will restructure. As they restructure, that's a euphemism for actually getting rid of businesses. Um, some will go into administration for the right reasons, some for the wrong reasons. Um, they'll come out of administration and they will divest other businesses. It doesn't mean they're necessarily bad businesses but it will provide us with investment opportunities. So I would be looking now with some cash on the side, not to rush out and be buying the first thing and get sold off by large corporations, but there'll be elements coming out of this, which I think are going to be very interesting opportunities where companies need the cash. These things are being sold off quite often at a discount, and that's an opportunity for us to be able to do. Put that in your higher risk basket. So make sure your portfolio is suitably defensively structured for the moment to make sure we're giving you longer term returns uh, but then have your basket on one side here two things one to take advantage of once you've gone through this stage some of this further volatility and two to actually use the advantage of some of these businesses being sold off which we can then say that's good value um, they're selling it because they need the cash uh, and we can actually take buy a big decent asset with a long term view to it and those may well be those smaller technology ones Okay, and keep some cash aside for these regional corona bonds as well. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's, that in many ways may well be our apology to say, look, I'm, I can't work in a hospital or anything like that, but at least I can do my bit to try and support it. It's almost like a war bond, I suppose, something like that. But I'd okay. also be looking for my regional funds as well. If we can get the regional funding sorted out, I think there'll be some fascinating opportunities there. But it needs some innovation. And for that, I need some help from the government and the politicians to actually have some innovation ideas themselves. Not always very good at that, but we're working on it. Okay, fantastic. Justin Urquhart-Stewart, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Thank you.